So um, actually, I can thank my mom for my name, which I didn't love growing up, I will tell you, because kids can be cruel, but now I love it. Um, and so many things um, that she said were true. Um, today, I want to talk to you about the invisible universe, but I do need to apologize off the bat for anybody who wants to hear about dark matter or dark energy, because that's not exactly what I'm going to talk about. But uh, in contrast to Gavin's talk, um, you don't have to get too antsy or worried about the future. Um, this talk is going to be sort of universe appreciation, um, but also hopefully the universe in ways that most of you have not seen it before. Um, so let's start. Um, I grew up just looking at the night sky, just looking up out at night. Um, I loved to do it. I think it started with the moon, just wondering what the hell is that big white light. Um, but then it just continued and just looking at the stars on any given night. And to this day, whenever I walk out of any building in New York, the first thing I do is look up. Sometimes I'm rudely surprised because I'm in Midtown and I can't see anything. Um, but other times you'd be surprised. So I encourage all of you, whether you live in New York or other cities, to still just look up day or night and just sort of notice what the sky is doing. So most of us probably don't see this unless we do live somewhere rural. Um, and then if you live somewhere extra rural, you might be lucky enough to see this. And this is our Milky Way galaxy sort of strewn across the sky. Um, fun fact, in case you didn't know, uh, the word galaxy, the root of the word is lac, lactose, milk. So the Greeks named galaxies because they thought it looked like milk on the sky. So we are inside the Milky Way. So this view is actually kind of the view from inside a pancake, looking towards the middle of the pancake. Um, this is an artist's rendition of the Milky Way, just sort of showing that it has some spiral structure. And we're a little bit over halfway out. Also, if anyone ever shows you a picture and says that it's the Milky Way from outside, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Definitely exercise your skepticism there. Um, the farthest thing that we've sent right now is uh, not even days, light days away. So the Milky Way is probably, is about uh, 100,000 light years across. So, okay, nearest neighbor. Oftentimes we do use this picture to sort of imply the Milky Way because we're kind of twin galaxies. This is the Andromeda galaxy. So we think we're both structured the same. Um, and you just see this from a different angle because galaxies, are, they're randomly distributed throughout the universe. So you're gonna see them face on, you're gonna see them edge on um, in all different ways. Here's a gorgeous spiral um, face on that you can see some fantastic spiral arms on. Sometimes spirals actually have a big bar in the middle of them. In astronomy, we're very literal, so we call that a barred spiral. <laughs> and then we have elliptical galaxies, which are sort of amorphous blobs. Um, and they can have a relative blobby factor that gets bigger and bigger. So even though that looks like it's all gas and maybe something in the center, that's actually probably hundreds of billions of stars um, because elliptical galaxies are some of the most massive galaxies in the universe. But galaxies can also look like this, which maybe some of you can tell that this might be two galaxies sort of interacting. And so neither one sort of looks like a straight spiral or a straight elliptical. They can also look like this. And even like this, where it's just a whole tangled mess. Um, and that's because galaxies are constantly evolving, but they're evolving on time scales that are so beyond our time scale. They're happening, these collisions happen on millions, even billions of years. So this is also a galaxy. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is how this matches with that previous picture. And the difference is that we're looking with a different type of light. So we're putting on radio glasses and not using our normal eyes. So our eyes here on Earth, our sun gives off the majority of its light in the visible spectrum. And so as we evolved, as all most organisms evolved, the ones on the surface evolved eyes to see in that type of light. But in the universe, they actually, it gives off light of all different kinds. So just sort of to put us all on the same page, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. 
And electromagnetic is literally just a fancy word for light. So these are all different types of light. Radio, microwaves, infrared. The visible is just this tiny little piece, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray. So we're going from longer wavelengths, which means lower temperature, lower energy, up to the highest, highest temperature, highest energy. Um, and you're familiar with all of these different wavelengths in your daily life, regardless of whether or not you look at the universe with them. So the big one is just radio. And one of my sort of pet peeves is the fact that radio is light. It's not sound. So you use a radio to get radio signals, and then it transfers that into sound waves and plays them out for you. But you're getting radio waves, even from satellites, are coming to these towers, and they're still being sent as light to your car, to your um, satellite radio, wherever it is. But then we also, we use microwaves. Uh, our military uses heat vision, infrared, essentially. Um, we all wear sunglasses to protect ourselves from the UV light of the sun. Some of us, when we're younger, love black light parties, which are essentially UV light. Um, X-rays, dentist, doctor, all the time. Um, and we don't actually use gamma rays in real life, just in some sci-fi shows. If you actually use them in real life, please do not. Um, so these are just sort of for your cheat sheet here. They're placed along the spectrum here. So radio is the longest wavelength, gamma ray is the shortest. And like I said, that visible part of the spectrum is really, really tiny. Um, Gavin mentioned that he was talking about um, scales of 14 orders of magnitude. Um, this is arbitrarily 15 orders of magnitude. And actually, we don't even know it's arbitrary because there could be waves that are longer than the radio waves that we've detected. We just don't have the instruments to detect them yet. And same, there could be gamma ray, higher energy than gamma rays, and we don't have the technology to detect that yet. So these are just the boundaries of our technology for now. And essentially, if you actually think about it, that visible part of the spectrum is like 1%, less than 1% of all of the light, which means that if we only observe the universe in visible light, we're pretty much missing the 99%. So let's start again with our Milky Way galaxy. So this is now a much better picture, and this is an accurate picture of the Milky Way. It's just a composite from many, many nights of observing. And we're looking towards the middle of the pancake there. If we want to look at the Milky Way with all different types of light, you can see that it looks completely different. So that is the 1% again. Um, and then everything else is the 99%. So starting at the top from radio waves all the way down to gamma rays. And you can see that there's different structures that pop out at you. There's a, a big dot that's in the X-ray and gamma ray that you can kind of see in the radio. The infrared is super bright compared to the optical where there's this dark band of dust. So this is the most text that I have on a slide for this entire presentation, and you do not need to know it all. But I just want, for those of you that sort of like to see it all down in one place, like I do, essentially, the temperatures I'm giving here are Kelvin. Um, it's about 273 degrees, sorry, 273 degrees uh, Kelvin is zero Fahrenheit, zero in Celsius, Celsius, sorry. But as soon as you get to the thousands, you can just think of them as the same, because the 200's not gonna make much difference, give or take. Um, so radio waves are actually detecting phenomenon that have very, very low temperatures. Um, you know, we can't even get anything to zero Kelvin. That's absolute zero. That's an active area of research. Um, but there are things like cold molecular gas um, and electrons moving in magnetic fields that you can see with the radio telescopes. So these are bodies that are emitting those types of light. Microwaves, you're looking at just like 1 to 10. You can see the cosmic microwave background, which I can talk about afterwards if anybody wants to. Um, infrared, optical, so just going up. Gamma rays, over 100 billion degrees Kelvin. So that's a lot. And those are some of the highest energy phenomena in the universe that we can see in X-ray and gamma ray. Okay. So now let's put it to use and start with our own galaxy. So what if we could look at our own galaxy 
in all these different types of light? How much different would it look and what would we learn? So first of all, this is just sort of making the globe flat, like a Mercator projection sort of thing. A lot of times you will see these pictures of our Milky Way and that's sort of just implying that if you were at the center and you could wrap this into a globe, that would be our view, looking out in all directions. So here's that dust lane again. So let's go all the way to the lower end. So this is radio. Um, and as a caveat for all of these pictures that I'm gonna show, anything that's not optical, the colors are somewhat arbitrarily assigned by whoever was processing the data. But in general, they're sort of on an intensity scale. So here, red would be the most intense, the highest energy of the radio spectrum here, and blue or black would be the lowest. So as you expect, the middle of our galaxy um, is where, this is a pancake, so there's all these stars in the disk. That's a lot of emission, but then there's these huge arcs. So there's huge arcs of molecular gas that are being thrown up above and below the plane of our galaxy. I forgot to put the label there, but this is just molecular hydrogen. So the universe is mostly hydrogen and helium, and hydrogen is what we need to condense and cool and form stars. So anywhere where hydrogen is, molecular hydrogen, is where we think there's a lot of fuel for forming stars. Here's a microwave. And you can watch as they change to see some of the structure similarity and some of it um, dissimilarity, and then some of it kind of come back. So this is far infrared. A lot of times people will actually break up some of the bands into bigger and smaller ones. So infrared comes in far, middle, near. Also, yeah, feel free to ooh and ah because they are gorgeous. <laughs> And this is what's really cool, I think, especially it's so obvious with near infrared that when you go from optical to infrared, we can't see through the dust. We can't see the center of our galaxy, which is a massive amount of stars, a lot of things happening there. But infrared, we can see through the dust. And then if you get to other lengths of infrared, you can't see through the dust because some of the dust is actually re-radiating, but some of it is actually letting the light through. So now let's go to X-ray, completely different. So X-rays are coming from like really high energy um, phenomena that usually go with compact objects. So pulsars, neutron stars, supernovas. So they're more point sources. And similar with gamma ray. So also keep in mind that some of these X-ray and gamma ray, these are some, especially gamma ray, these are transient phenomena. So this is actually a map of a bunch of different phenomena that have been observed at different times that are kind of put together. Um, but also pay attention to this sort of above and below diffuseness, and we'll come back to that. We might have an explanation for what's happening in our galaxy. Okay, so let's now do the same thing with our nearest neighbor, Andromeda. It's just so that it aligns with everything, I'm gonna flip it, but then how many people have had this as their background once upon a time with a Mac? Did you notice how apparently Apple doesn't like M33, which is the other galaxy there? It's like galaxy contamination, discrimination, I don't know. Okay, so let's go to Andromeda and the radio. So you can see that there's rings of gas around Andromeda, not much in the middle. But then the infrared, so now we're getting to where some of the dust is. Dust and cold gas are sort of necessary for both star formation and then planet formation. So a lot of times a star will condense out of a cool cloud, but there will be amounts of dust in that that are large enough to form planets, but very small compared to the amount of gas that needs to form a star. So we'll go to the optical. Now we'll go to ultraviolet. So ultraviolet is actually picking out those hot young blue stars, high mass stars um, that are burning in Andromeda. Um, X-ray, again, and now you can sort of see there's a little X-ray bubble, too. So we're gonna come back to that. Okay, so Andromeda is roughly, it's two and a half billion light years, sorry, two and a half million light years away from us. Um, we're gonna come back to our galaxy now. So the Crab Nebula is in our galaxy. It's like 6,500 light years away. Um, also, I had to translate these numbers because astronomers, we do not think in light years because if we did, the numbers get way too big, way too fast. Um, 
But I also want to draw your attention to most of the pictures that you see, crab nebula, um, eagle nebula, all these nebulae that Hubble observes, they're all in our galaxy. So they're all local. That's, to an astronomer, that's really like the neighborhood. That's nearby. Um, it's only the ones that are of other galaxies that are of these other phenomenon farther away. But the other important thing to realize, both with this, um, with the different types of light, but also with different types of galaxies, is that it's been less than 100 years since we realized that the Milky Way was one galaxy and other blobs were other galaxies. That was 1929, thanks to Hubble, who got the telescope named after him, appropriately enough. And then with the different types of light, it's still been less than 75 years since we've turned anything to the sky other than optical telescopes. So radio astronomy, X-ray astronomy, gamma ray astronomy, all of this is less than 75 years old. So just think, you know, sort of what we're still out there, what's still out there to learn. Okay, so the Crab Nebula is a pulsar um, that was left behind after a supernova. So it's a combination of a supernova remnant with a pulsar in the middle. Um, the Chinese actually first discovered this in 1054. So it's one of the oldest objects that we've been able to kind of continuously observe um, and have a lot of data on, which is really kind of cool. So here it is in radio. So you can see where that dust is. Sorry, molecular gas. Infrared. Optical. Ultraviolet. Now you can totally see that pulsar. And the pulsar has got a jet coming out of it too. Also, this pulsar is spinning around 30 times a second. For reference, our sun turns once every 26 days. 30 times a second. So that's why it's high energy and it's giving off x-rays because it's ridiculously excitable. Uh, and then we also do get gamma rays from it. Oh yeah, that's a great question. So pulsars are much smaller. So the end stage, um, they're really compact. So they're gonna be various sizes, but for reference, this entire nebula, the Crab Nebula, is roughly 10 light years across. And our nearest star is four. So it actually would engulf like us and Proxima Centauri. This whole nebula would surround us. But the pulsar would be smaller than the sun. So Chandra, NASA Chandra, makes fantastic compilations of these kind of things. So these are different images than the ones I showed you, but they're still representing the lower wavelengths up to the visible. Multiple x-ray ones that they'll show you here, really showing this structure. So the whole point being, if we only looked at this with our optical eyes, we would have no idea about that pulsar activity. Um, it just tells you so much more. You look at this, and it does look like the aftermath of an explosion. But if you look at this, to me, that screams like, things are happening here. There's material coming out. Things are spinning. Um, things are getting heated up. And so even though this is taking place on those time scales again, that are so much longer than our day to day, year to year, century to century, um, clearly, the pulsar is spinning on a time scale we can understand, but the rest of the nebula is still growing slowly. But so much is happening. Like, I love that it takes a static image and turns it into something really dynamic. Okay, so now we're going to get to a little bit more of those X ray bubbles. So, this is a really exciting named galaxy, NGC 5128, um, because after you know, a couple hundred, you kind of have to come up with catalog names. So this is the new general catalog. So this is a dusty, even dustier than the Milky Way galaxy that you're seeing from edge on. But now let's see what it's doing in other wavelengths. That's what it's doing in the radio. So this is why I love radio. So past, um, some of my past experiences as a radio astronomy researcher, and I got to study these. So these are jets of material that are spewing out, and this is on the same scale. The same there. No, it overlay it exactly as I'm flipping these slides. So that's the optical, 
and that's the radio. So the radio is happening on these scales that's so much larger than the optical galaxy. You look at that optical, you have no idea this is happening. And what's happening here is there is a supermassive black hole in the center, which there is in almost every galaxy, that's what we believe. But some of them are more active than others, and so this one's clearly in an active phase. And what happens is it's not the black hole that's giving up this off, because the black hole eats everything, but there's an area around it. It's kind of like the waiting line to get in the black hole. Um, like if you were all at a roller rink or an ice skating rink and going around, but you packed as many people in there, if you're still all trying to go around, you're all moving up against each other and everyone's getting really hot and sweaty probably. So you're all radiating heat. So this ends up doing that, but in radio, that accretion disk is just bits of dust and gas that are getting really, really close, building up friction. Um, and they have to radiate in order for that disk to stay stable. So radio jets happen on times, uh, scale sizes that are uh, five to 10 times the size of the galaxy itself. And then this is my new favorite picture that I found while making this talk because this just shows that one isolated disk of dust um, in this galaxy. So it's not saying that that's the only dust, but that's particular dust that's only radiating at the far infrared. So then this is more near infrared. And then the optical. And now the X-ray is interestingly showing both a little bit of a jet and a little bit of a bubble. And it turns out there's, there's often a correlation between X-ray and radio astronomy where they're uh, both adding to the knowledge of what's happening outside of that galaxy. So the X-ray ends up being sort of where the jets from the radio are slamming into the intercluster medium. So we like to say that space is empty and space is a vacuum, but it's actually not on the, t on the giant spatial scales that we're talking about. There is gas and dust between the galaxies, call it the intergalactic medium. So those jets are hitting something, and the more dense, the faster they go, and the more dense of something they hit, the more they end up shocking that gas and heating it to X-ray temperatures. So here's another clearer X-ray. So a lot of these are just looking at small bands of light so that they just get the one phenomenon. And then here's another X-ray. So we also have X-rays that are soft, medium, and hard. So here's a composite of a lot of those wavelengths all put together. So again, it's not the exact same photos, but you can see the orange is those radio jets, the bluish purple is those X-ray bubbles and the X-ray jet, and you can see some of the uh, dust lanes, both in infrared and optical. So again, this screams something is happening here. Um, and all of this is actually how galaxies grow and evolve because they are, come in groups and clusters and superclusters. So they're not acting alone. They're not ever isolated. So imagine this happening in your neighborhood. It's going to affect how your particular galaxy is going to grow and going to evolve and how hot gas has to cool to form stars. So a lot of times, if the jets are on, stars are not forming. OK, so I'm going to bring you back to this one, because this one is my favorite. It's the loudest, as in brightest, radio source in the sky. This one is actually oh, 60 million light years away. Um, and these are those jets again. And that little dot in the center is where the optical galaxy is. But you're going to be really surprised that it's not as big as that last one was. It's that tiny thing in the center. Just to drive it home. That's the optical. And it's actually two galaxies merging. So eventually, those two galaxies are in some sort of process of merging. They each have a supermassive black hole. And that supermassive black hole is going to, uh, they're going to merge and then become one more massive supermassive black hole. <laughs> and then again, this now is the radio is in pink, and now there's x-ray thrown in. So you can see that there's x-ray gas that is getting heated up by these jets. Um, and you can see the difference in these jets from this one to this one. This one has these really bright spots at the edge. So those, those are called hot spots, because again, we're very literal. Um, and that's where those jets are finally hitting something more dense. Um, but clearly, these are sort of like more waffly. So a couple different things. They could either be in the process of turning off and maybe they're sort of fading out, 
or it just might be that there's not much there to stop them. Um, and so they're just sort of flying off. So the other cool thing about this is the shape of the jets, the collimation of the jets can tell you a lot about that environment. So my big sort of takeaway from this is one, that you look up, but also two, that you realize that you know, when you look at something one way, there's a lot of different ways to look at something and you might not be getting the whole picture. And it's kind of incredible how much we've been missing of what's going on in the universe uh, until 75 years ago. And even then, we're still only getting pieces of it. So right now, um, the Hubble telescope will be winding down, but the James Webb Space Telescope will be launching. And yay, James Webb fans. <laughs> I actually highly recommend you follow NASA Goddard's uh, social media because they have great images of the telescope, which is now in testing at NASA Johnson. Um, and eventually will be transported by ship to French Guiana, where they're gonna launch it on an RM5 rocket uh, in October 2008. But James Webb doesn't quite cover the same wavelengths as Hubble. It's gonna be shifted towards the infrared, um, but it's gonna have a capacity way beyond Hubble. So we're always sort of building the new, new windows, new telescopes into seeing the universe in all the different wavelengths um, and getting sort of the whole story, um, which I think we'll never have the whole story because every time somebody's thought we're done with this field or we're done with this object, there's a whole new way to think about it based on one piece of new data, one new telescope, one new wavelength, et cetera. Um, so this has been your universe appreciation morning. Um, so hopefully that will inspire you for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Any questions? Sure. I will try my best. If they have to do with relativity, I'm going to pass. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my 15-year-old sister is starting to get into astronomy, so I bought her like a basic optical telescope. Um, what are some of your favorite things to look at? Oh, that's a great question. Um, number one, the moon. Make sure to keep that. Um, it's incredible, Make actually, sure through a telescope, especially if it's not full. So you want to look along the terminator, so when it's uh, growing or shrinking, that's where you can see the craters best, and you really get the topographical um, aspect of it. Uh, Jupiter is a super favorite because you can see the four Galilean moons. Um, and that's kind of amazing because when you're looking at that, uh, that's what Galileo saw. And just over 400 years ago, he saw those four points of light, saw how they moved night to night, and then was like, oh, things go around things other than the sun, or other than the earth, so maybe we should rethink this. So it's kind of just this weird, cool connection. Um, Saturn, always a favorite too, because Saturn looks like it's fake. Looks like somebody just puts a picture at the end of your telescope, but it's kind of crazy that that's really Saturn. Um, and then one last thing, you can actually, it depends where you are, and it depends the power of the telescope, but um, you can find some nebulae, the Orion Nebula and the um, Ring Nebula are worth a try. <clears throat> there was a recent article in Scientific American um, talking about uh, black holes and uh, the fact that the LIGO experiment has found three different uh, colliding black holes now that were about 30 solar masses. Um, <clears throat> and there are a uh, hypothesis in the article was that uh, these black holes might actually represent what we call dark matter because we don't know uh, any way that we can get 30 solar mass black holes currently. I wanted to get your opinion about it. Um, that's a great question. So I'm not an expert in intermediate mass black holes, but the black holes, so LIGO is this laser interferometer gravitational observatory, um, and it's actually not detecting light. It's detecting ripples in space-time. So the fabric of space-time is actually being warped by two black holes or two neutron stars or neutron star and a pulsar, very compact objects moving very fast around each other and then merging. Um, so three times now it's found, I think, cases of black hole, black hole mergers. Um, and we can back out from that signal how massive they would have been. Um, I think intermediate massive black holes, intermediate mass black holes is a very active area of research. 
So right now there's supermassive black holes that are on the order of millions of times more massive than our sun. And then there's black holes that are formed when a star dies, but only the highest mass stars do that. So some of them do end up being 10, 20 mass, solar mass stars turn into black holes. So 30 is kind of just on the cusp of that. Um, so we are, have simulations that tell us sort of how those form, but what we have to do based on exactly like Gavin said is we have to match our models to our observations. And so since LIGO only just came online, it's a matter of what are we biased in detecting first? So we're biased in detecting those and then maybe it'll show us some other new window into different mass black holes uh, merging many more times than we ever thought that they would. So we sort of have to wait for more data, which is usually an answer to everything too. <laughs> Early in my career, I was uh, involved in geophysics. And one of the big things we had to do a lot of our processing power on was mirroring and lensing and removing, correcting for all that to get positionally accurate. So my question is, most of these images today, has that been applied? Is there, are they positionally accurate when you look at these images? Um, in, in any given image? Yeah, so uh, the majority of the images that I've been showing you are from s everything except the radio is mostly space-based telescopes. Um, and so they're very, very precise. Like Hubble is extremely within an arc second, which is one sure 60th of one 60th um, of a degree on the sky. So they're very accurate. The radio ones might be, they're a little bit, um, they vary because the thing with radio telescopes is that most of them are arrays. So it's kind of like they're interferometers, which is exactly what your eyes are. So you're sort of, you have two telescopes right here and they synthesize a full view. So the same. What about gravitational lensing? Oh yeah, no, but these would not have gravitational lensing in them because that happens on much larger uh, spatial scales than these things. And if they are, then they would be known to be in a cluster that we would see them lensed. Hi, I was interested in, you said that the uh, 15 orders of magnitude of the electromagnetic spectrum is somewhat arbitrary because that's what we can detect. So can one say anything about what's beyond that? Is it thought that something exists there and we just can't see it? We or don't know. It, we don't know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite answer to give, but it's very true because we don't know. Um, just like we didn't know that there were radio waves coming from space. We didn't know that there were microwaves coming from space. So I don't know if I mentioned the cosmic microwave background radiation, but the fun story about that, that's the afterglow of the Big Bang, um, is that there were two different teams trying to, well, one team was trying to find it. They, they, hypo, sorry, they hypothesized that it was out there. There was another team that was just trying to observe the sun. Um, but when they looked at the sun in the wavelengths that they were looking at, they actually got like noise from all over the sky and they were like, what is going on? This is really annoying. Um, so they tried everything to try and figure out what was contaminating their signal. Um, and they had a big sort of, it looks like a horn. It doesn't look like what a telescope looks like when you're in your head. Um, and there were pigeons living in it. So I even at one point thought that it was pigeon poo was <laughs> contaminating the signal, but it turned out it was actually the Big Bang. Um, so that's a hell of a way to get scooped. <laughs> Any other questions? We're good? All right, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>